Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Getting In a College Coach Conversation. I am your host, Ian Fisher. We're really excited about the show that we've got lined up for you today. And I don't want to waste any time in introducing our first guest. Uh, we have with us, those of you who are watching on video can see uh, George Philip Laborde. Uh, GP, I've, I've always just called you GP. I don't even know if I got your last name. You correct. did it did so perfectly. You All right, wonderful. Excellent. GP is uh, really uh, affirm, affirmational and positive, and so I, I, he, he always helps me to feel good about everything, including how I pronounce his last name. Uh, he's also the head of partnerships for an organization called Polygen. So we're going to talk a little bit later about Polygen and the work that they do to support students' research projects. But GP, I want to just jump into a conversation about research because it is a word that a lot of high school students we talk to are kicking around all the time, whether it's mm -hmm. something they're looking for out of their undergraduate experience, whether it's something they feel they need to do as a part of their high school experience, research, research, research. And I think that sometimes we don't even pause to define what that is. So in your experience as uh, an undergraduate, also in earning a PhD, uh, how have you come to understand what research is? Ian, uh, it's a great way to kick off the conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is a topic that when I was in high school, I didn't think too actively about, but the way that I describe my high school experience growing up in a small town in Maine was I was very curious about a lot of things. And um, rather than being a good planner or a good uh good at time management, for example, mm -hmm. I really just followed my interests. And um, I think that um, that's a great place to start. But one of the other great values of research is that it really does help you to develop those other skills around your interests that allow you to plan, that allow you to um, pursue things in a systematic way. Yeah. And I think that if we take a step back to your question about what actually is research in the broadest terms, that's how I would define it. It's, it's a systematic investigation of a topic that leads to new discoveries, whether it be for you or whether it be for a specific field or, you know, humanity at large, so to speak. Um, I, I, I just, I'm, I love that idea of new discoveries. I think the initial instinct that I have is, okay, we're, we're contributing something to the body of human understanding, but I love that you have defined that language as also being a discovery that could occur for an individual. I've, I've now learned something that others know, but through the research process have come to understand it for myself and thus have a deeper understanding, which I think goes to ideas around basic research. You're looking at things that other people have historically explored, but it's that process that often can be really rich and rewarding uh, for students. So absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there, sometimes there can be an apprehension for students who are just getting into it that feel that what could they do if they're just jumping into the research pool to discover mm -hmm. something that's actually new that could move the needle in terms of cancer biology or, um, discovering a new dinosaur bone or something like that. Yeah. And the, the thing that I take away is that like everything else that you do in high school, there's so much that's important to learn the processes in so that when you get to those next levels in college and after college, after graduate school, you can apply those skills that you've learned and actually lead to those little those little amazing moments where you discover something that's entirely new for, again, the sum total of your field or, or, or of humanity at large. So another analogy that I like to use because in my own research, who was really interested in sort of how things move across space. And so um, I, you know, I worked a lot with uh, friends in cultural geography and people who, uh, who actively make maps, cartographers, to oh. think about research as mapping uncharted intellectual space through repeatable steps. And if you think back to all of those old, hmm. you know, middle, um, uh, middle 15th, 16th century maps where things were very ill-defined and there was literally terra incognita, unknown yeah. land written there. Right. Research is sort of filling in those unknown lands with your own discoveries, information that you can then pass down to future researchers as well. I, the map analogy is interesting. You know, I was at the uh, Library of Congress just a couple of weeks ago um, with my daughter, and we were looking at some early maps from the late 1800s. Mm. And um, there, they had a world map there. And Europe looked very much like it does on our present day maps. But the rest of the world 
had these shapes that you could, you know, tell was kind of North America and maybe that's Africa there, but definitely needed more detail and more exploration. Yes. And so when you look at something like a map, it's great because you can get the rough idea with the first pass. But then every time you go back to that space, you have an opportunity to learn something more deeply to offer greater clarification. And so I like that map analogy because there is kind of this knowable sphere and the things that we know as humanity can expand by virtue of the research that we do. Um, you mentioned your research. Now mm -hmm. you're, you have a PhD, um, so you've done plenty of it. Um, what did you do your research in to, to earn your PhD and, and maybe an early research that you did um, even as an undergraduate that kind of pushed you in that direction? Yeah, this is a great question. I love talking about it. Research has opened so many doors to me. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it has been the source of many great adventures. So I think that that, uh, that sort of cartographic comparison of, of mapping new space really holds true for me specifically. But I can bring you all the way back to my time in high school. And I remember on one day sort of sitting, I was a little sick that day. So I remember sort of my head in my hand, listening to my um, history teacher, um, Charlie Hudson, talk about um, the pyramids in Egypt. And I just okay. remember thinking, man, this is for an AP world history class. And I just remember thinking, you know, I, what the thing that I love about this subject is that I am learning so much about everything to do with this culture and society. I'm learning about not only how they made these buildings, but I'm learning about why they made the buildings and what languages were inscribed on the buildings and how we interpret the buildings, you know, centuries later. Mm -hmm. And so I was really drawn to this idea of art and architecture as being sort of a lens through which I could explore a lot of different things. Yeah. That's what led me to study art and art history and architecture at Middlebury College for my undergrad degree. And I really explored a lot of different subjects. Again, through my love of uh, exploration, I learned a lot of languages and so studied abroad in Florence and in Paris and really spent a lot of time thinking about architecture there and wrote an undergrad um, thesis on really the intersection between, um, it was on uh, a, an Italian painter named Carlo Carrà, who was very interested in mathematical representation, representations of space and time mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. So there are great connections with not only political discourse and the revolutions of the early 20th century, but also with mathematicians and physicists who are trying to sort of set down some sort of interpretive models for how the world and time worked that the general public could understand. So it was through that interest in um, studying, you know, really world history through languages and culture and the art and architecture that they left behind. Um, that I uh, did a master's um, also in art history at Williams College. They have a very small master's program. Okay. And I focused there on, essentially it was um, photographic surveys of the Alps in the mid 19th century. The reason this was really interesting to me is that this was still uncharted space because when people went up historically to the top of places like Mont Blanc, they suffered from altitude sickness. And so yes. there were all of these travel logs with strange distortions of what people saw. They still believed that glaciers were inhabited by demons that needed to be exercised or that dragons lived up at these high altitudes. And so I saw photography and you know, photography is sometimes taken to be inconvertible truth in um, over-determined ways. It's really, it's still very subjective. And as we all well know, Photoshop can change our perspective of things pretty drastically. Okay. They, they had 19th century versions of Photoshop that they, that they also used. Huh. But I was thinking of these pictures as a way of sort of marking space in a way, in a, in a more truthful way or a more transparent way than people mm -hmm. had previously experienced. And that was really, um, you know, an amazing uh, process of research for me that brought me into old travel logs from 19th century physicians and artists. And that actually brought me to uh, Switzerland on a, on a Fulbright research grant where I worked at universities to sort of pour through their archives and think about these materials, not just from a researcher's perspective, but from a public perspective as well. So we created this public facing database as part of a consortium um, through a number of universities as I was working at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And um, just to make this research available for other people so they too could explore what these people had written back in the 19th century and look at pictures or engravings, read their writing and so forth. 
So I took that experience and then applied it to a lot of the work that I did at Stanford. Um, and my dissertation there was focused on the first photographic survey of the Arctic, which was from 1869, financed by uh, the head of the New York Stock Exchange and led by not a scientist, but by an artist who was mm -hmm. uh, really a failed businessman originally. Um, and he was from uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, which, was, which in many ways was sort of the central hub of the whaling industry and so of a lot of global capital. And um, that led me um, personally on a tall ship into the Arctic Circle to do sort of in-person research around these landscapes that have changed so much over the course of um, the time when they were initially photographed until now. So you started with the pyramids and you just basically went north. Uh, That's it. That's it. <laughs> until until so, you reach the top of the globe. Some I, what more I, intelligent people would go to the Caribbean, but yes, the Arctic <laughs> is what. Uh, let's just keep what's seeing what's what's you know further further north. Um, I it's it's really interesting. I think because um, the specificity um, of the projects that you're exploring, right? A particular artist in the early 20th century, a particular set of photographs from a particular mountain uh, in in Switzerland, right? Looking at the Arctic Circle, like these are questions that are very, very detailed. And I think a lot of students worry that if they're going to get involved in research, they don't have that level of specificity, right? They would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in cancer research, or I'm interested in learning more about Bolivia, or, and, and they have these big, big open-ended questions. But I think that how do you help students to not feel intimidated by the degree of detail in a research program like what you explored and to feel like there's opportunity in something that's much broader and open-ended like what looking at Bolivia? Ian, this, this is such a great question. And I, I, I recognize that this is, I don't know that I would have had a good answer in high school as to what I would have wanted to jump into and, and explore. that's important for people to acknowledge, right? Like you weren't yes. like, oh, someday I'm gonna be looking at the Arctic Circle. That Exactly. That was a part of a, series of events that brought you to that space. Yes. And I think that the reason that I ended up there is that I was sort of, I made myself open to that process of exploration that research entails. I think what's really challenging is that we want in many ways now, and students today are so in many ways organized and uh, intentional about where they want to study, what they want to do afterwards in a way that, you know, maybe some other people weren't that I, I was not when I first started um, this journey. I was not, yeah. Yes, and <laughs> so that can be, that has a virtue because when you plan, you at least have something to go by and then you can deviate if you wish. But it also means that um, those opportunities or really those, you know, those signs in the road where you have to say, I'm, I'm going left or I'm going right, um, it can be really intimidating to, to say, oh, I'm going to study Bolivia rather than Ecuador. And what does that mean about, will I ever, ever, ever be able to go back to Ecuador or will I always be stuck in Bolivia? Yeah. And at one of our symposia at Polygence, we had um, Dr. Margot Gerritsen, who's a professor of um, engineering at Stanford and really a great advocate for um, all women in, in technical fields, specifically in data science. And she showed us what her career path was that brought her to teaching at Stanford. Mm -hmm. This was not something she ever dreamed of or planned. Mm -hmm. Instead of a straight line on a graph leading to one location, she basically drew a squiggly line with lots of recursive circles yeah. and switchbacks and said, this is the reason that I'm here is because I said yes to these other opportunities that did not follow a linear path to bring me to Stanford. And that's what I would pay for to students too. If you have something like Bolivia that you, you say, I just want, I don't know, I want to learn more about it, um, begin that process, dive into it. There's going to be a lot of stuff. Another analogy I like to use, uh, having taught film classes, is there's going to be a lot on the cutting room floor. You're yeah. going to have to slash away all of those things that, you know, maybe take you days or weeks or sometimes even months that lead to a dead end or don't lead you where you thought you were going to go. And you have to understand how to take that experience with you pivot or reorient yourself and then continue on with the knowledge that you've gained. So very often that time, um, those papers that we write and, and don't get published or 
those um, research trips that we take to the library that just produce a stack of notes that don't even make it into the papers. Um, that can be frustrating, but I want students to know that that's a big important part of the process, um, going wow. through those repetitions yeah. um, and being okay with um, turning around or walking away. That's also really important. One of the frustrating things that I think sometimes I hear, and it's just, I, sometimes it's just a mismatch in terms of lingo, but you know, you'll hear students that say, I want to develop my spike, or I want to have the mm. thing that's going to stand out in my application. And for me, that process is more about chiseling down, chiseling away to identify what it is. And I think a lot of students conceive of it as building up from the ground that I'm going to identify what it is that I'm interested in. And then I'm going to build that thing. When in fact, there's a lot more of, you know, these instances of failure where you go and you do a bunch of research and it doesn't prove any, any fruits for you, but, but you're willing to keep exploring because you've got that sense of curiosity. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about polygens, um, that little, you know, you've got a circle up in the corner there that uh, for those who are interested in how you would spell that, and it's at polygents.org, um, which is a great organization that you've been with for uh, like two and a half years now. Is that right? Actually, only one and a half. It feels only one like and a half I years. Was, I was actually working as a mentor, working with students directly before then, but I've been a part of this core team in my current role for about a year and a half now. Fantastic. And, and so, so Polygents is this great organization that essentially matches students with curiosity, uh, with mentors who are expert researchers in the field and can help students to find a project that they want to work on, a project that they want to develop. Um, what have you most enjoyed about, you know, watching those matches happen with students uh, at Polygens? Yeah, um, I, this is a question I love to answer because students, I think, who are willing to follow their curiosity and creativity, perhaps in unconventional ways, um, you know, to your point about creating that spike, if, if a student is interested in something very specific and esoteric, then those kinds of experiences stand out when admissions readers are going through your applications. But I think more importantly, they actually introduce a student to something that's really meaningful and rewarding for them. And uh, certainly those experiences can happen in school classes, but very often what I see is those classes that you take in school are sort of like that first jump into the research pool. It's the first jump into human biology. And then you yeah. start to realize, I just spoke with a student yesterday who, was a little timid at first in our conversation, but by and by, as I asked her why she was interested in human bio and then in cancer biology and then in uh, oncology in particular, it was because she had um, you know, found to be fascinating how genes basically, um, they produce uh, inaccurate signals. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the formation of cancer cells in different, you know, in different manifestations in different parts of the body. But her question was really, why do these, why is there, why are those transcription errors? Why do those errors occur? And how can we begin to prevent them? And that based even on a broad intuition um, and her understanding of human bio was pretty rudimentary, I would say, after having just taken one class, she had through her own curiosity sort of whittled down in our conversation to a question that is at the core of what so many oncologists and cancer biologists are researching right now in their respective uh, fields. So um, when I see students who are able to take that big idea and put aside the intimidation of being able to you know, make a contribution to science or something like that, and they actually just follow their curiosity, um, more often than not, that leads them to exactly where they need to go, which is asking specific questions where a specific person can really help them um, get into the field and understand not only uh, how to answer those questions, but then what questions to ask next to continue that journey. So a couple of good examples that are uh, really creative, I think, are sure. one student we had um, was interested in neuroscience, which is a very popular field, as you might imagine. It certainly is. Um, yeah. Many students are interested in things that are sort of related to psychology, some are interested more in things like neurodegeneration. So there are many different ways of attacking it. And he didn't really know which way to go. But through our conversation, we learned that his little brother had been consistently asking, why do I feel full? I wanna keep eating, but my tummy won't let me. What's up with that? And mm -hmm. so the student was able to basically take this really innocent question from his little brother 
and understand that this is a neuroscience issue. This is a question of feedback between the gut and the brain that sends signals to you that says, you don't need to eat anymore. Your, your stomach is full. You've reached this moment of, of satiation. Yeah. And so he, working with one of my colleagues who was um, a chemist, uh, wrote he wrote and authored and 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 uh, drew an original children's book called The Adventures of Brandon and Gigabit, all about this process of feedback that goes into making you feel full. And so I think that's another great example of something that is asking a question. It's not, you know, it is not reinventing the wheel. It's not no. sort of the next, uh, it's not the next MacArthur winning cancer development or whatever you, but it is a great example of that student's own interest and then their own curiosity, their, their unique and authentic um, uh, creativity that they've, they've created this book um, to show. So uh, that, that's just an example that I love. It's a great one. And I think authenticity is something we talk about on the show all the time. So listeners will be <clears throat> familiar with that term. And it's great to hear it come through in the research process as well. Folks, if you are interested in learning more about polygens or you've got a student who's got some curiosity they'd like to explore, uh, GP, should they just go to polygents.org and, and look into uh, the program through the website? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Fantastic. We're going to continue to send some students your way as long as they've got that, that little kernel of curiosity. And we really appreciate the ongoing support that, that uh, your entire organization has shown uh, the students at College Coach. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you for your continued work. Really appreciate really it. Really my pleasure, Ian. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, uh, folks, when we come back, we are going to talk to uh, one of our client services staff about hiring an independent counselor and, and whether that's a good idea or not. I think she's probably going to say yes. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 